Hello, everybody. Welcome back to our series of podcasts that we call Menninger Mindscape. I'm Dr. John Oldham, Chief of Staff at the Menninger Clinic. It's my pleasure to welcome as our guest today, Dr. Paul Schultz. Paul, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Dr. Schultz is Professor of Neurology at the University of Texas Health Science Center here in Houston. He's also um, someone who's very, very expert in thinking about and um, teaching about how to assess competency, cognitive capacity. That's been very interesting to us, and in fact, we have in October coming up our annual fall conference, which uh, will be held here in Houston, and that's going to be on advances. Uh, it's called Advances in Clinical Psychiatry, and our theme this year is Impairments in Cognition. So Paul's going to be one of our presenters and speakers, and he's going to be talking about some interesting dimensions to the question about cognition, centering on ethical issues in connection with cognitive impairment. And also for the talk, you'll be talking about some aspects of medical legal issues, which come up as well. Mm -hmm. But this has been a central area, I think, of interest and work for you, uh, particularly in terms of also how to assess and evaluate whether there's a problem present or not. Yeah. So we'll only have time to hit a few highlights, but. But talk to us about that a bit. Oh my gosh, if, uh, you know, with the success in heart disease, cancer, and stroke, and us all living longer, unfortunately all of the neurodegenerative diseases are age-related. And so if it was a business, you would call it a growth industry, unfortunately. But for those of us studying, it provides a great deal of material and motivates us every day to study how to diagnose people better and how to treat them better. We're working on quite a few different ways of diagnosing neurodegenerative diseases better with blood tests, imaging, and so forth, and working on treating them with all kinds of innovative ways of lowering amyloid, lowering other abnormal proteins in the body. For this talk that we're going to be giving in October there, one of the questions is, what cognitive functions do you have to have to be able to make informed decisions and have capacity? Informed consent is the process, of course, by which us as physicians give our patients information. And if you have a competent patient and you give them enough material to think about, they can make an informed decision. But if any one of those three things isn't working right, then we don't fulfill our duty to make sure that, that our patients are in control of their lives to the extent they can be. And in our field, that's sort of standard operating procedure for, let's say, when a patient comes into the hospital. Yes. So here at Menninger, we have to be clear, this is a voluntary hospital, so that means that patients have to have the capacity to make the decision to voluntarily come into the hospital. Yes. And the same is true for a neurology hospital uh, unit or other kinds of hospitalization and other decisions. Yes, everything we do, whether it's research or procedures coming in the hospital, they all require someone to be able to make a decision. And we as physicians have to decide if that's the person in front of us or whether there's impairment there such that they really can't make a responsible decision, in which case we may have to look at other family members to help us out with that. We don't have time to talk about this, but how did you get interested in this particular area? My whole life, I have been fascinated by how people make decisions. <laughs> and the idea that how you feel and how you think enters into the decision you make is something that I've been enamored by lifelong and when I found out there was a profession uh, that, went with it. <laughs> that you could do that called neuropsychiatry, it was a natural for me. I'm still fascinated every day in clinic when I'm sitting with someone asking them questions to see what they're going to say and how they're going to respond and how I can use what's working well or not well to figure out what's going on with them. Is it early onset Alzheimer's, is it bipolar disease, etc. And to sort out all those things requires yeah. mostly just listening to a person and figuring out how they think and feel in a respectful way, of course, which is the, the human side of medicine is that we get to help people. The intellectual side is we get to figure out what's going on with them and try to help them. But the listening part is very important. And of course, in the field of psychiatry, that is something we are very attuned to as well. Um, I, I don't know if there's a general answer for this, but is there a, a, a modal kind of set of circumstances that would be likely to bring somebody to see you with mm -hmm. the question 
do I need help? Oh yeah, no, every day people come in, some reluctantly and some voluntarily. For most people who have insight, they're worried about something they've noticed. I call it affect behavior cognition, a change in mood, change in behavior, or a change in their memory, language kind of things. But many people that I see who have problems don't recognize it because that part of their brain doesn't work 100%. And their loved ones will bring them in uh, with an observation. And then we try to gently, respectfully to everybody, talk to both parties and try to figure out what's going on and see what, what we can establish about what's genuinely changed versus normal for age. Between the age of 20 and 80, all of our concentration and therefore memory changes 40%. 40%. 40%, yes. So if I'm I see a... I'm sure that's not discouraging. <laughs> exactly. So if I see a 59-year-old who says, I'm, my memory's not what it used to be, if it's only down 30%, I say, hey, welcome to the club. That's normal for age. But if it's 50% reduced, then we have to figure out why, why they're off of the curve that the, the rest of us are on. You hear so often people worried, let's say, I'm worried about mom and dad or one of them. Should they be driving? They're stubborn, they insist on being fine, and they're not. Yes. So you, I'm sure, have developed a very sensitive ability to talk to somebody who's nervous about aging and about losing ability cognitively. Yeah. Oh boy, that's, that would be a several day talk to go through <laughs> what I've learned through experience, hard knocks, et cetera, and trying things sure. out. One aspect is how you make that decision, and then there's all kinds of brain areas that are important for making decisions, and I try to assess that to get a real impression about what they can do and not. But once you've established, as you suggest there, that maybe someone shouldn't be doing their own finances or their own medicines or signing on a mortgage, driving, then that's a real tough situation to do in a delicate fashion. We try really hard to talk to people and explain what's going on. The challenge is a lot of times people who have true cognitive impairment don't have the insight. Right, right. So if you turned to me now and told me, Paul, you just said that five minutes ago, I would say that doesn't make any sense. I would know if I had just said that. Right. I wouldn't know that I was forgetful. And so it becomes real challenge, and we have to use a lot of, I would call them gentle nudges, tricks, things like that to get people. One of the ones that's turned out to be really valuable is I was on the state committee for driving uh, assessment. And we just decided that none of us have figured out a good way to bring that up without interfering with our relationship with our patients. And so the new state rule now is that everybody with memory impairment has to get a special driving test. And that way it took it out of our hands. But for all of the other decisions like medications and finances, we don't have anything like that. And so we have to work very hard with them. Right. Sometimes I have to meet people quite a few times and develop their trust and then start circling around and saying, you know, You've got loved ones here who you, you obviously married her for a reason. You've raised your kids well. Now we've got the two of them sitting here telling us there's an issue. I know it's not possible to see that. Just like if my partner here told me I was forgetful, I wouldn't be able to see that. And yet there is something going on. And could we just maybe take a moratorium on this? Mm -hmm. Could we sort of for a while give up the driving or give up the finances? We'll circle back to it. This isn't forever necessarily. We'll circle back. Well, that's a very nice way to put it. I mean, even if you're not sure that's likely, yes. it's not out of the question. It's not out of the question. And it gives them hope. Well, because they might have been under a lot of stress about this, oh, yes. which some relief could maybe improve their ability to still do some things. Yes. It helps their mood a lot and helps them think more positively about a you know, very difficult circumstance when you tell someone they've got one of these neurodegenerative diseases. And I think families, for the most part, must appreciate things like the rules of the Drivers Bureau. The, the way my, my father-in-law's family handled it was to take the battery out of the car. Right. That didn't go over too well. Yeah, yeah, we used to always take the keys, take the battery, whatever. Smart guys would figure out how to get in there or get angry. Now it's not their loved one, it's not me. It's the state of Texas. <laughs> who makes decisions like that. And I say, you know what? You may well pass the test, go ahead and take it. I mean, you wanna drive, take it, and God willing, you'll pass it and you'll keep driving. But if you don't pass it, thank goodness you and I will know that it's not a good idea to be driving and then it won't be safe for you and you certainly don't wanna be in an accident and so forth. Now, I'm gonna ask, we're gonna run out of time. We always run out of time. So I'm gonna ask you an unfair question. 
because it's unfair since the answer would take a lot of time. Sure. <laughs> but all over the news is concern about Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. It's got to start somewhere. Yeah. So many of these people worrying mm -hmm. probably have that in their mind that this mm -hmm. could be something terrible down mm -hmm. the road. The question is not to sort of go into depth about how you make that determination, but are, are there significant steps of progress that have been made mm -hmm. once that is, in fact, a pretty clear diagnosis? Are we better equipped to help people with it? We are. I would say the biggest thing we've done is recognize that we can prevent 80% of Alzheimer's disease. People estimate somewhere between 60 and 80% by lifestyle factors early on. We think that people are actually getting Alzheimer's 10 to 20 years before their first symptom, and we're still most successful at that time. If we control blood pressure, cholesterol, triglycerides, weight, stop smoking, all of those kinds of things, we can very significantly reduce the chances of getting it. That's what we're still most successful at. Once they get it, the meds help. Do come in and see us early, all of us, if you have a concern about it, because the meds are most effective when started early. And what I will do and you will do when we see these folks is we'll give them the new meds, but we'll also still control all the risk factors that affect the rate of progression. And then we all pray that one of the several hundred studies going on with Alzheimer's will be successful today, next week, next year. None of us know when it will be, but it gives us a lot of hope that there are so many trials going on. Yeah, see, that, and that, but that's so interesting because your answer to my question is also applicable across a lot of medicine. That's true. It's, we need to pay attention to having a healthy lifestyle. Yes. And to not get to giving up smoking. Um, our facility here is going smoke free. We're late in the game, but we are doing that uh, in the next couple of months. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just not fair uh, to continue to support that indirectly. But it's true for cardiovascular disease. It's true for all kinds of other things that if you in fact can exercise, watch your weight, keep your blood pressure under good control, um, all of that will be prevention important and will help you really head off or delay right. the kind of problem that we're all going to face in one form or another. Yes, we do. That's absolutely correct. Lifestyle is a huge issue for all of us. Yeah. It's also one of the reasons in psychiatry we think that, or I often argue that integrated care and mm -hmm. partnership medicine with medicine, psychiatry, behavior yes. is all critically important and we've all got to work closely together. Yes, absolutely. And you do that every day. I even bicycle to work and honestly that's one of the biggest things I do for my patients when they see me come in. They say, God, the guy actually practices what he preaches. It's hard to do. It's inconvenient. I could do something like that yeah. to try to get more healthy. You're setting a good model. <laughs> Hopefully. Good. Well, we're going to hear a whole lot more about what you're talking about and, and um, really appreciate your coming in today just to give us a, a, a tip or two about what we'll learn more about later. Um, so thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, a real pleasure. Great. I hope some of you can come and join our October Symposium. Uh, and if you go to the Baylor College of Medicine website and the Department of Psychiatry, um, you can get um, a link and register for it or get information about the full program. But if not, uh, I hope you've enjoyed this uh, summary uh, discussion about this really important topic. And we'll see you all next time.